Shalom. And it's my, uh, my pleasure to follow Sir Eric. Thank you for inviting me here today. And thank you to all of you for coming. I am proud to join with you in showing our determination to stand up to terrorism and our solidarity with its victims, whether they be in Paris, Ankara or Tel Aviv. The violence which has engulfed Israel since last September is horrifying. 34 people killed, 198 stabbings, 394 people injured. We cannot name all of them, but it is important that the victims are not reduced to statistics. Each was somebody's son, daughter, brother, sister, mum or dad. So on behalf of all of them, let's remember Daphne Meyer, a nurse and mother to six children who was murdered in her home. 13-year-old Noah, who was stabbed and critically injured while he rode his bikes on the streets of North Jerusalem. And Alan Goldberg, Haim Harviv and Richard Larkin, who were killed as they rode on a bus to Harman Hanatsi. Such violence cannot be ignored, justified or excused. It can only be condemned clearly, unequivocally and forcefully. This is the time to stand with the people of Israel as they come under attack in their homes and on the streets of their cities. Over the past year, I've visited Israel and the West Bank on three occasions. And amid its beauty, I've witnessed the scars of war and conflict. The children's crash close to the Gaza border, which was hit by a rocket in July 2014. The heavily armed soldiers who now patrol the streets of Jerusalem's old city, a place holy to Christians, Muslims and Jews. And the security scanners, which mean that even a trip to a shopping centre carries with it a reminder of the ever-present threat of terrorism. But I've also seen signs of hope too. The mother at a kibbutz in southern Israel who spoke of her concern both for her own children and the children of Gaza. They are just as much the victims of Hamas as we are, she told me. The new city of Rawabi in the West Bank where a courageous and far-sighted Palestinian entrepreneur is building not just homes but the foundations of a future peace. And coexistence projects like NEET in Jerusalem, which brings together young Palestinians and Israelis to teach them about technology, entrepreneurship and leadership. And more importantly, teaches them about what they have in common, not what divides them. Listening to those young people talk of the new friendships they have formed reminded me of the words of Nelson Mandela. No one is born hating another person because of the colour of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate and if they can learn to hate they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. But sadly, the quiet voices of those who seek to further the cause of coexistence are at risk of being drowned out by those who seem intent on teaching the children of Palestine to hate, by those who pump out virulently anti-Semitic television programmes, by school books which reject Israel's very right to exist, and by the Palestinian Authority's own Ministry of Education which honours terrorists and glorifies martyrdom. After all, what does it do to the mind of a five-year-old when they see children of their own age reciting poems on official Palestinian Authority TV in which Jews are called barbaric monkeys, the most evil among creations and wretched pigs? What lessons are young girls and boys supposed to draw from school books which refer to the so-called State of Israel and justify violence against it? What impact does it have on a teenager to go to school 
and there are at least 25 of them, or play in a sports tournament which the Ministry of Education has deigned to name after a terrorist. 13-year-old Ahmad Mansara and 15-year-old Hassan Mansara were not born hating the 13-year-old Jewish boy they attempted to stab to death. They were taught to hate him. And those two brothers are not unique. Look at the list of perpetrators of the stabbing attacks. Many of them are teenagers or younger. They have, as Hillary Clinton put it, been subjected to a form of child abuse. I am a passionate believer in the rights of the Jewish and Palestinian peoples to self-determination, each in a mutually recognised state of their own. I want to see Britain do all that it can to help to promote peace and a two-state solution. But it is now time to think again about how we best do that. Our government has sent at least £150 million via the Department for International Development to the Palestinian Authority over the past five years. Differed boasts of the number of children supported in Palestinian primary schools. It is worthy and important work. Education is an investment in peace. But indoctrinating children with messages of hate, which glorifies murder, and those who perpetrate it, takes us further away from that goal. And that is why last month I wrote to David Cameron, our Prime Minister, asking for an independent review into the impact of British aid and how it best supports the cause of peace. We must ensure that every pound we spend is invested in a better future for the Palestinian and Israeli people and not a single penny of it promoting terrorism, killing or anti-Semitism. to the Palestinian Authority that we demand an immediate cessation of incitement and expect it to take the lead in promoting coexistence, peace and reconciliation. But the people of Israel are not just under attack at home, they are also under attack abroad. And that is why we must have no truck with the BDS movement, which seeks to isolate demonise and delegitimise Israel and its people and does nothing to further the cause of peace and reconciliation. We see its pernicious effects here at home and Israeli tourists to our country refused an Airbnb room simply because he's an Israeli. An Israeli Segul girl refused help with her project on horses by an academic in our country simply because she is an Israeli. Students whose meetings in universities in our country are disrupted simply because they are Israeli. Of course students must be free to criticise the policies of the Israeli government, although I'd like to hear rather more voices raised in protest against the gross abuses of human rights perpetrated by the governments of Iran, Saudi Arabia, Gulf states, meted out to women, religious minorities and gay men and women by Hamas in Gaza. <laughs> All too often, however legitimate criticisms of the Israeli government, uh, all too often these, these legitimate criticisms of the Israeli government morph into attacks on Israel's right to exist, on the Jewish people's right to self-determination and then, of course, into an anti-Semitic discourse. We cannot allow this to go unchallenged. It is time that we establish some clear red lines which allow those who wish to protest against the policies of any government, allow them to do so, but protect Jewish students, many of whom may wish to participate in protests themselves, but feel intimidated and abused. Today, we express our determination to defeat those who wish to deny Israel's right to exist and terrorise its people. And let us redouble our efforts, our commitment to support peace. I close then with the words 
of Yitzhak Rabin. Words uttered at a moment of sadly dashed hopes when he signed the Oslo Accord in Washington. He said, we say to you today in a loud and clear voice, enough of blood and tears, enough, shalom.